got them. That's how fast they fix it. So uh, let's sing. Uh, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. just love him one more time thank you Jesus thank you Jesus we magnify you Lord praise God amen amazing grace you can be seated thank you uh, pray for uh, brother Turner yes he uh, he's not well this morning has needs the Lord to touch him we need the Lord to touch him and then we've already got our folks that are starting their vacations, believe it or not. And believe it or not, people are taking vacations. And so that's good. Uh, and the missionary work is going on. We're supposed to uh, preach in Serbia this year, Lord willing. And we have several things that are obstacles or challenges, but um, oh, I was going to, Say what a great job Sister French did. I love it when she can play along and be a part. And, and uh, so, and I tried to get her to play the grand, but she thought better of it. And so, but we're working on a song we're going to do here, just just Sister French and I. And uh, we're going to use the grand and just have a little little time of worship. Not not today, but but very soon. All right, so we're we're looking today at uh, the pastor series that was published in. This is about well, it's a it's a big chunk of the lesson uh, that is in the adult manual, and uh, there are five lessons they've had me write over the past two years during COVID. Uh, I was, was supposed to do a sixth, and I was unable to. So, um, so th these five lessons are um, 
things that they're teaching throughout the United Pentecostal Church. And, and uh, the first two have to do with the examples of Noah and the example of Jonah. So <clears throat> I'm not... Uh, <coughs> sorry, I'm not... Um, wanting to um, necessarily teach on the coming of the Lord, although you, you can't really talk about it without thinking about what it means for us today. And we all know that there are tons of people who claim to have faith in Christ and so on. They have no regard whatsoever for what the Bible says. They... They don't think the Bible really matters that much. I mean, you'd be surprised how many Christians, if, you, if you're wondering why American Christianity is in a mess, it's because they watch Hollywood far more than they watch after the things of God. They're completely mesmerized by Hollywood or sports or whatever the culture's doing. But the Bible is, holds very little interest to them. That doesn't mean they don't genuinely believe in the Lord or think the Lord is good and all that. But, of course, you can't hold that view and then have a, a proper understanding of, of what God is doing and certainly not prophecy. Most of these people I'm talking about don't even believe in prophecy. They think of prophecy as, uh, as just not true, as not real. And you can say, well, what about Jesus, Jesus himself? <clears throat> We're going to begin with Hebrews 11. If you would turn in your Bibles, why don't you, since it's going to be a brief lesson, uh, let's see where we are here. All right, we're okay. Um, and uh, so you can tell, uh, Brother French, that I'm a little hot up here. Just, I'm not wanting you to turn me off, but these, these um, right here are, are hot, so hot that I, I can't even move here. And that's not going to work. Eventually, I'm going to move. All right, Hebrews 11 and 7, that's going to be... Uh, the beginning here and uh, let's look at it together by faith everyone say by faith and of course that's the point Noah lived out his faith now the the uh, the we're living in a culture that doesn't believe it matters how you live okay that's why I'm teaching this lesson we're in a world where they say, I can do what I want to do. The Lord doesn't care. I'm under grace or I, I, I'm already uh, whatever. The Lord understands that I'm a this or I'm a that. In fact, we're in a culture where almost every sin that Hollywood is promoting, the church is promoting. In fact, the, the largest denomination in America, I don't know if you've heard about this. I'm going to be careful. I'm going to walk around it carefully because I'm not here to, I'm not, I don't want to get into that too deep. But the largest denomination in America is in the middle of the biggest, one of the biggest splits in American church history. Because they want to ordain ministers that violate the word of God. And they are ordaining ministers that violate the word of God. But thank the Lord, there's a, a huge group of those that are saying, no, 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 we're not going, no longer, we're not going along with it. And of course, that won't actually happen for a couple years because, or at least another year, because they were supposed to do the final vote during COVID and they canceled their general conference, just like the United Pentecostal Church did. And, and they're going to hold it later. And so what, we, what has happened is uh, we're, it affects our culture to the point that people actually believe they're going to go to heaven murderers and liars and thieves and and ungodliness are just going to go to heaven that's by the way there's nothing new in that it's just new for christians to think it now so noah lived out his faith and of course <clears throat> jesus said look to Noah." if you want to understand what's going to happen look to noah so by faith noah being warned of god of things not seen as yet moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. Can we just lift our voice and let's ask God to help us to get our families ready, to get the ark of safety prepared. Could we do that for just a moment? Father, right now I pray for everyone here today that we will see and recognize the value and the importance of getting our families into the ark of safety. Praise God. 
Now, of course, then there's the other aspect. Many, many Christians think that most of the Bible is just fairy tales. So David didn't kill a giant, and Noah didn't build an ark, and, and Moses didn't walk through the Red Sea, and so on. That, that's very common. The church I just described, you want to know why they're completely goofy now? It's because they began to accept about 100 years ago that the things in the Bible were just made up. They weren't actually real. They were okay, and I, I learned, when I was in seminary, I actually was in a fairly, I, I didn't go to a liberal seminary, but there was a liberal professor, and he was teaching us that there's nothing wrong with the Bible lying and saying it, because that was accepted in the ancient world. You would tell stories like, and he used the myth of the Greeks, where they had flying people like, who, I can't remember his name, the guy that could fly or somebody a, a minotaur or a uh, half goat half man all of that was made up and they're saying that it was done to tell a story and they were just telling a story they made adam and eve never lived that's exactly and and that's how they've ended up with christianity that's not christianity or christianity that no longer heeds the warning of of the bible and so it is. He, Noah, though, had faith. Everybody say faith. Praise God. Noah had faith. You, you need to have faith. You need to trust God. I, I'm talking to a generation right now that needs to get ready because Jesus is coming. He, that he was warned of God of things not seen as yet. I'm sure that, that, that the book of Hebrews there is referring to the fact that it had never rained. And so he had never seen rain. There had never been a flood. There couldn't have been a flood. There wasn't and never been rain. The earth was, was watered differently, and that's another. I'm not, I'm not trying to go there so much as I'm just mentioning it. But Noah was warned of God of things not seen as yet. But it's not only that it had not rained, but that God had never, never judged the entire world in such a fashion. And then Jesus links to this and said, well, you remember Noah's, by the way, Christians that say they don't believe that Noah lived or existed are saying that Jesus himself is a liar because Jesus himself, not here in Hebrews 11, but we're going to be there in just a moment where Jesus clearly said that Noah is your warning example for the end time. So being warned of God of things not seen as yet, he was moved with fear. Which, by the way, is the missing ingredient. For example, if you don't believe in a hell, then you're not going to fear hell. If you don't believe in a God, you're not going to fear God. Even though you might fear death, you might fear... Like, I've, l listen, let me, let me talk about mocking. I've I got I to gotta say this carefully. Some of you are actually... Start, you know, you're awake, and so I want to I say this very carefully. I've never seen the kind of fear that we're seeing right now over COVID-19. I've never seen that kind, not among, not among American people, to where, we, you know, we had World War II people, now that doesn't mean that fear means you're a coward, I'm not, I'm, so I'm trying to say this carefully, but what has happened to our culture is suddenly there is this very real possibility that a, a virus that is unpredictable might take the lives of someone that you love or may have taken the life uh, i was talking to brother carson who preached a great message here friday night what an awesome service we had and i was telling him about people that <clears throat> were very dear to us and the way this has affected our minds and our my thinking and so on but i'm going to tell you right now as much as i'm concerned about loved ones and concerned about covid and so forth even though covid is definitely way way it's about 10 percent of it was in january so it was a hundred percent let's say in january the worst that it had ever been and now it's down to 10 percent of that and going down actually it's about nine percent as of this morning the point being that yes there there's something to be concerned about and careful nobody's suggesting we not be careful but the but my point is this i do not fear a thing i fear god that's who we must fear it's strange to me that a people that are not the least bit concerned about the world and judgment from god are scared out of their minds now listen if you're in india right now you'd be you'd be very worried because india is going through the the worst of it right now 
And uh, we're trying to figure out, you know, they're trying to figure out why. So, see, I'm not here trying to analyze it. I am telling you that no matter what this world does, I know I'm going to die. And I don't want to die. I'm not asking God to die. But I do not fear death. I fear the God that holds death in his hands. You see, it's got to be, this, this culture is so evil. You talk about racism. Racism is not the only evil of this culture. This culture is evil on so many levels, and in so many ways that we need to analyze how we can get the favor of God. Can you say praise the Lord? Praise God. Noah didn't, had never seen it before, but he was moved with fear and prepared an ark to the saving of his house. And so it is. Now, Hebrews 13, a few chapters later, I want to use this as a, before I go to the next slide. So I'm taking it out of context, but we're going to put it in the context. So how can I please God? That's the context. How can I please God? All right. Well, it says to do good. Everybody say to do good. Now, folks, you know that when you're using your voice to destroy other people, your words, or you're hurting them, or you're purposely attempting to uh, tear people uh, down, or to undermine people, or to uh, whatever, whenever you know the difference between good and bad, uh, Of course, we, we, we live in a world where people don't know the difference in good and evil. So I, I'm not, uh, what I'm trying to say is that Christians know they should be doing good. And you don't need, um, like I meet Christians all the time that say, well, I, I love the Lord. I live for God. Now my, but we do this and we do that. And I say, well, you know, the Bible says this and we, that's how we live. I have people do it all the time. They say it all the time. And I, for example, I, I cannot tell you the, the times that people have come to me and said, I love your church. And uh, I'm just, my mind is just flooding. I mean, the Holy Ghost is in this place. Let's just love him. Let's just love him one more time. Father, I love you today. Lord, I want to live my faith. I know that there are times we're not sure how to do it exactly, but we know we can do good in this world, oh God. Hallelujah. Lord, we never want to do evil toward anyone, but we're going to stand for righteousness and love God. We praise you, God. Think of a world. Okay, I'm going to say this. Think of a world where... That culture believes if I preach against sin that's dis- given clearly in the Bible, then I'm evil for preaching against the sin that the Bible describes. By the way, this is going to lead. Now, I don't believe it will. Let's praise him one more time. I do not believe this is going to happen. I, I don't believe it's going to happen until, I don't, <laughs> I'm not sure. But I, I know when the Antichrist gets here, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be rampant. But I'm talking about now. I, I know that what this will lead to, if there's not an interruption, is the Bible will be banned. Just like Hitler did. Just like every culture does. When they don't like it, then they try to destroy it. That's the world we're in. But let me tell you, it makes no difference. We're going to preach the word of God, love the word of God, stand on the word of God, believe the word of God. We're going to live out our faith. And guess what? There's going to be mighty revival. I believe the Holy Ghost has told me through prophecy and through the anointing that we're going to see people coming from the east and the west, the north and the south. They're going to come to this place if we will preach the gospel. If we preach holiness and righteousness, if we compromise and walk the way of the world, I do not know what will happen. 
I know what the scripture says will happen, but I have seen a vision of God drawing people from east and west, and this is why the devil is so mad. Does anybody know that the devil knows that he has but a short time, and so he's going to and fro, he's doing everything he can do? So he, we're living in a world that's upside down. The very real possibility of the, don't, and don't think so, you, if you don't think so, uh, then stay tuned because we're going to come back to that later. Pastors are being arrested right now as I'm standing here. So it is. To do good and to communicate. So in other words, let me reword it. Don't forget to do good and communicate. The problem is the way the King James translates this, this uh, Greek word, uh, is communicate, but that, but I think if you will think of it more as to share with others or sharing, so do good and share. In other words, care about other people. And I'm not just talking about do-gooders. I'm talking about you really want to help other people. Does it, anybody here want to help other people? You see, uh, and we can and we must. We must be about helping other people. Now, I want to read this, uh, uh, this, I wrote this for uh, headquarters. Success in garnering genuine favor has been an element of the human condition from the dawn of time. The response of the heart to heroic and noble actions are deep and often surprisingly universal, especially when those deeds have profoundly impacted events or moments in time or were deeply significant spiritually. So what, what caused, a, this is the story, the, the Nathan Hale to become a national hero, and, and still to this day, when you mention his name, people stand up and tears run down their face. The example is in a name in American patriotism which has come to be associated with the very word loyalty and to embody the favor of our entire nation the 21-year-old Revolutionary War soldier, Nathan Hale. After graduating Yale in 1773, Hale became a school teacher in his native Connecticut, then only to close the little one-room schoolhouse in New London to join the Continental Army in 1776 and defend his nation. To this day, that building is proudly preserved to the honor of Hale's life and actions and to an event considered one of the greatest moments in all American patriotism. When you hear the name Nathan Hale, it was deemed an amazing act of selfless service in the inaugural dawn of the newly emerging nation of America. What kind of favor would inculcate Hale's heroics into the national consciousness in such a way that it remains alive 250 years later? So <clears throat> I, I see in, in, in my love of the story of Nathan Hale, uh, the understanding of what it is to have favor. September 1776, in serious and urgent service to his nation and to General George Washington in responding to the General George Washington, Nathan Hale was captured and hanged by the invading British army. What the young man represented, though, was far more than the sum of his actions that day. Yes, a young 21-year-old was hung, but his actions resulted in an indelible bestowal of a favor rarely seen in the American life. People would remember the name of Nathan Hale with tears and pride as a symbol of their own struggles as a free people, just like Things will stir us today. It's just that this young man lived 250 years ago. The slightest historical recollection of this young man's life and comportment, in fact, his every word, became the pride for the entire nation because his actions were viewed as a sacrifice on behalf of the entire nation. In the weeks before Hale's capture, the colonies had suffered disastrous defeat by the British in New York. Looked like they were going to win. It was urgent that Washington find out the location of the British invasion on, of Manhattan Island, which was, uh, which was supposed to be any, any hour. 
And Hale quickly and willingly volunteered to go behind the enemy lines. The story of his capture and heroic death spread instantly throughout the Americas. A rallying cry for endurance, not merely because of his actions, but because of the way he offered his life for his country. He requested a Bible and a clergyman, but was refused. He then bravely faced his executioners with these departing words before he was hung. I only regret that I have but one life to give for my country. Those words have rung through history to this very day. I'm talking about it here this morning. Because of his actions, favor was stirred up in the hearts of the American people. Not surprisingly, therefore, statues have been erected in his name. And I've seen one of them preaching in Connecticut once. And stamps issued in his honor and with his image. Nathan Hale remains the official state hero of Connecticut 250 years after his death. But just as dramatic symbolic favor can be rendered as the result of actions, so the converse can mark unworthy actions, such as those of the man who symbolizes treason more than any other. Does anyone know who I'm referring to? It was, a, it was a contemporary of Nathan Hale, became known as Mr. Treason. His name was Benedict Arnold. Interestingly, it was Benjamin Talmadge, Hale's college classmate, who revealed the betrayal of Arnold's 1780 intended surrender. In other words, Benedict Arnold was going to surrender West Point in New York to the British. Of course, his plans failed, and he defeated and then fought for the enemy. So, I mean, he defected and then fought for the enemy. So Hale was an American citizen who turned on his own country and fought for the enemy. As a result of these actions, Benedict Arnold, like Judas, is the byword for betrayal and the antithesis of favor. And so it is that God, let's go to the next slide. And so it is that we can have favor. I think we should just ask the Lord. Can we just ask God right now? Father, I want to be what you want me to be. I pray for your favor in my life that my family can be blessed. I pray for the blessing of God and for your will in my life. Hallelujah. So God favored Noah and revealed his role in the coming judgment. And that's what God is doing now. The Lord is preparing the world for judgment. They're just not listening. So first of all, I want to look at Genesis 6.3. Uh, I've got a pointer here somewhere. We still don't have <laughs> uh, everything set up, even though we have the pulpit up here. Um, so the point, let's read that. The point of what? Uh, of no return. All right, to say it again. The point of? No return. All right, so Genesis 6, 3 says, My spirit shall not what? Always strive with man. In other words, there's a point of no return. There's a point at which God will give up on a sinful people. That's what he did in, 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 Noah, uh, in, in Noah's day. And that's what we're talking about. Basically, the point of no return. Now, let's look at three scriptures. First of all, is God's sorrow that man was judgment worthy. Now, this is a very important to me. Nakam is the Hebrew word for to repent. It repented me, he said, that I have made them. Um, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping things, and the fowl of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Now, and, and so it is that, um, <clears throat> that God uh, demonstrated uh, sorrow for the fact that man would be judged. And I'm going to come back to that in just a moment. Now, also Genesis 6 and 11, and this is the moral, the problem of Noah's day was moral and spiritual decay. Listen, the trick is, okay, I'll put this in the middle of my living room, and then whatever comes on, well, I just turned it on. This is the way it is. Young people today now have telephones, so they're watching things on tele. Listen, young people, it's time, it's high time for us to say, I'm saying no to sin and I am not going to be led around by the enemy by the devil I'm going to live holy and I'm going to keep myself pure before God now so Genesis 6 11 the earth was corrupt 
Now the Hebrew word corrupt, we don't have time for a Hebrew lesson, but the, the, the Hebrew word for corrupt means to be destroyed from inside. In other words, there comes a point where a people and even a culture or even a world, in the case of Noah's day, it was the entire world. And uh, I think, I, I mean, I hear from people that are highly, you know, they really think they're finding answers. And they say, well, tell me it's not possible the whole world would be corrupt. I mean, you can't say everybody in the whole world is corrupt. And, and of course, the Bible never said that everybody, now listen to me, listen, I'm trying to talk. It didn't say everybody in the world was totally corrupt. It didn't say that. Noah certainly was not. His children were not. Everybody say, praise God. Hallelujah. Okay, my point though, okay, uh, here we go. The point is, they didn't have to be totally corrupt. Everybody didn't have to be totally corrupt. If you're waiting for everybody to reflect what Hollywood is now teaching, and they are teaching, don't think they're not. They are teaching our children, if you allow them, and many are. They are teaching them the Bible means nothing. There is no God. There certainly is no God that cares about anything that the Bible talks about and that they can do whatever they please. So this is a corruption that comes from within. The, the point, though, is where, when do you reach the point of no return? What happens to a world that reaches the point of no return? Now, Jesus himself has told us to look to Noah and so I'm looking for this evidence in my world as, as I see the world corrupted. So the earth was, cor was corrupt before God. And what else? Right here, not just corrupt, but what else? The earth was filled with violence. This, means, this Hebrew word means the, per the, the permeation, is, I think that's a word. Permeation... <laughs> I think it's supposed to mean that the world is so permeated. Do you know what that means? Soaked or infused with injustice. That uh, it's irreversible. Sin that is so rooted. And so the question is this. When does a culture become so evil that it cannot be saved? That God said, the day is coming, I'm going to take my church out of this world because there's no more saving the world. When does that day come? Well, whenever that day comes, you better be ready because that's when the judgment's going to, that's what we call, by the way, if you're wondering what that is, it's called the book of Revelation. Every minute in the book of Revelation is the day I'm talking about. Okay, so that's that, all right? So the, it was they were corrupt, that means they were what happens to a people that are so corrupted? Let me ask you this. Okay. So what do you think of this? Is this corrupt or evil? All right. So you want to have fun. You want to play football. Or maybe not football. How about getting into the Colosseums and throwing people to lions and watching them be devoured by lions? How about getting men who fight each other till they murder one another and call them gladiators? Is that a corrupt people? Folks, what I'm trying to tell you is God is sickened by the corruption of man and there is a point of no return. It's that simple. Okay, well, anyway, um, I, I find it interesting that injustice... Uh, Uh, okay, so let's go to now verse 5. I'm, you see that I'm skipping around here because I'm trying to make a point. God, God is sorrowful that judgment is coming. I'm going to come back to that. Uh, it's, it's because of moral and spiritual decay. In other words, it's, it's inside of man. And, you know, I'm pretty positive. I'm constantly preaching that anybody can be saved. Doesn't matter how, how bad. I wish everybody in this room could have heard the message Friday night. Basically, Brother Carson was preaching that there, there's nobody that God can't use. I don't care who you are. And I believe that. Amen. I certainly believe that. God can do anything. He isn't just looking for the nice, sweet people that, uh, you know, he's, he's looking for everybody and he's willing to save them. But... 
a people can become so corrupted from within that there's no, there's no saving them. Now, Genesis 6 says, 5, the wickedness of man. Everyone say wickedness. The wickedness of man was great in the earth. I wish I had time. I wish I had a little more time, but I'm trying to, uh, wait, 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 let me see what, what kind of time we do have. All right. So the wickedness of man brought about God's disfavor. Now I want to say this, and I, I know I'm being heard by people that may not understand what I'm saying. America can become so wicked if we are not careful. That whatever judgment falls upon us and injures us, how many? This is just, um, just a little survey. Um, how many of you had a hard time at any point in the last week or two? of actually getting gas. In other words, you had to, you couldn't get gas where you went to get gas. Anybody? How many? All right, there's over here, the, whoa, you guys, whoa. <laughs> this, this part of the church, do you have gas today? <laughs> Hallelujah, you can have some of mine, but I almost ran out this morning. Okay, how, anybody, anybody else, you, you had a hard time finding, at some point you went and you could not get gas, you had to go somewhere else. Now only like 10% of the gas is gone, so it's in Atlanta is where the worst of this is happening in our state. Anybody over here, you had, okay, so that's, that's a pretty good number. Well, you know why that happened? Because, um, well, first of all, the reason it's led up is because the, the government paid the ransom. Because the government said they wanted X millions of dollars to open the pipelines. So they paid. Now, if you find that's incorrect, please let me know. Because I've been reading, trying to figure it out. And how did they get the pipelines open? And the answer is, the government decided they couldn't stop it. They would pay the ransom. So, when... And, and, the, and the group, that I, I, I'm, I'm talking things I'm not sure of. I think the group is called like the, do you know, brother, the dark something, the dark world, the dark side, the dark side. Okay, the dark side doesn't sound good to me. Hey, hey, folks. But, you know, you, so you start paying the ransom. What, you know what that tells me? They're going to keep trying. We're, we're living, let, let me tell you, I, I said it a year ago. The first thing we ought to have done over COVID is had a national day of prayer. We should have cried out to God. But no, we, we, we went right on our way. Let, but let me tell you right now, when a, when a people becomes so wicked that God can no longer give him his favor, I just find it mind-boggling. I do. I find it. I, you know what I see happening in our nation is a, a decaying of decency. Decency. The wickedness of man was great in the earth and every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only wicked, con I mean evil continually. That's the last scripture there. For years this, this scripture bothered me. I've, it's only been recently that I've begun to, th I think I'm seeing because how was it that every imagination of the thoughts of man's heart was only evil? How could that possibly be? And, uh, and so it was. So what actually happened is the good, now listen to me, the good that's in the world, and there's good in the world. Can you say praise God, there's good in the world. I've got neighbors that are, don't know a thing about apostolic except me. And my wife, my family, and our grandkids who run all over their yards. So what they know about apostolic is a six little kids running all over. <laughs> that's what they know. But they're good. They're good people. My neighbor right across from me is a, goes to a church and, and, uh, and he's a very devout man. Very devout man. I have another neighbor that's uh, 
uh, I, I don't know that they go to any church whatsoever. I don't think they do. And, uh, and on and on and on. But there's some really good people around there. But let me tell you, just being good will not stop what God is going to do. Because what happens is, evil can become so great that it negates the good in everybody else. Nobody takes a stand. The minute you let the devil run rampant, Okay, I'm going to say this. Okay. Um, um. <laughs> oh, God, oh, God. Uh, you need to be thankful that I, whoever's out there, you're listening to me. Um, you need to thank God that I'm not the president because I wouldn't pay a nickel. We'd have called a fast. Anybody believe God can break the chains? Hallelujah. Now, I will, listen, you don't have to worry. I'm never going to be elected to even dog catcher. I have not the least a desire to be anything, especially dog catcher. But the fact of the matter is that, you know, these men do the best they can. They're in a very difficult place. I'm not judging anybody. I'm telling you that if it were me, We'd be saying, all right, everybody's fasting. <laughs> That's what they did in the Bible. And guess what? All the d demons would be screaming, how dare you? <laughs> and I'd just say, I'm calling a fast in Jesus. Listen, I get criticized for calling a fast in the church. We're going to have three days of fasting. Well, God, well, I'm blah, blah, blah. And you think I just murdered somebody. Because I called a fast. Why didn't you give us six months to get rid of you? Whatever. I mean that kind of as a, you know, it, it is true, but um, I mean it nice. Um, so the good, in, that good that's in the world is negated because the culture becomes so evil that it's sort of like if you have light. Brother... Uh, are y'all able, well, we can't do it, but even like the, you dim the lights, the, the more the pressure to dim the lights, the, the more the lights go down, the less you can see. Doesn't mean there's no light at all, you know, there may be a little bit of light. And I've preached many a sermon about that little bit of light, you know. Praise God, I'm getting ready to preach one about that little bit of light. Because I want to tell you, ain't nobody taking my light. Hallelujah. I've been changed by the hand of God. And so it is, evil nature can become so strong. Now let's go to the next one. I've, I think I still have a little, little bit of time. All right, here we go. So Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord, Genesis 6 and 8. Everybody say, Noah found favor. Found favor. <laughs> can you say it? Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Now let's go back to this question about God. Um, in Genesis 6 and 6. So we're looking at uh, favor. Is, he found favor, which at the bottom you see is the Hebrew word can, which I gave you in English letters. I know you're thankful. And it's often translated grace. I'm pretty sure the King James says Noah found grace, but it's the Hebrew word for grace or favor or something like that. But uh, Many times people think that for when God sends judgment that he's just, just rejoicing. But the fact of the matter is, God is, uh, is very concerned. And that's why his mercy uh, continues to work in people's lives. I mean, look how long God has allowed uh, sin to run loose in the streets. But the fact of the matter is, the Bible says... That it grieved him. Can you see that? Let me look up there. Okay, yeah, I, I, you can see it better than I can see it in my notes. It everybody say grieved. It grieved him. So, so man's sin and the judgment that was coming grieved him at his heart. This this Hebrew word is connected to a Hebrew word that means to cut. Now I get a little criticism for this. Uh, because there are those who don't believe God can 
uh, be affected by things like this. And so when you say God, uh, God's heart was cut, because you notice here I said that this indicates God's sorrow and pain over men rejecting him. God actually feels, you know, God, uh, now I, I have a whole line of these eggheads. Can I say egghead? Sister French, where is, she, where is she? Are you here? Oh, oh there you are. Um, um, is saying egghead, is that mean? Because that's kind of like saying, making fun of people. <laughs> Uh, egghead. I don't know where it even came from, folks. I, I didn't invent that. Has anybody ever heard of an egghead? Anybody talked about someone being an egghead? It doesn't sound very good, does it? I shouldn't talk that way, should I? No? Okay, I was afraid that wasn't right. But when you weren't here last week, I said it several times. <laughs> because uh, the idea, though, is that there's these guys that, that don't think that God has any feeling. That God has any sense of feeling because he's God. He's God. He doesn't feel anything. I said, well, I don't know how you got to know God so well. But the God I know seems to feel even my affirmity. Through Jesus Christ, he took on my infirmity. So, so that's another subject. But... What this Hebrew word is telling us is that it cuts the heart of God. You say, well, how can anybody cut the heart of God? Do you think that it is cutting the heart of God, the kind of culture that we're living in? And young people being ripped apart by people with billions. Listen, these singers that are singing this unbelievable nonsense, making billions. I, I, I mean, to me, it's like, whoa. Billion. What is she worth? Six billion dollars. And she's a singer? I don't understand why I'm not richer. Sister French, why am I not richer than I am? I mean, billions of dollars just sing absolute garbage. And I know they're talented. That's the world we're in. Does that cut the heart of God that young people will be lied to and they will believe a lie and be damned? Is that, does that break the heart of God? I want to tell you, yes, I believe it does. I believe God looked at the world in Noah's day and said, it breaks my heart. It grieved him in his very soul, in the depth of his being, that man was as he was. And so it is. The rebellion of man broke the heart of God. But Noah's faith was demonstrated in a way, in such a way that you could see it. It was lived outwardly. He lived in such a way that his faith was obvious in a sinful world, and it brought God's favor upon him. Can you say praise the Lord? And that's the way we should live. We should live obvious. Don't ask yourself, which group lets me do anything I want and pretend I'm going to heaven? It's just kooky. I mean, folks, listen, it's cuckoo. Someone said, can I chew gum? I, listen, it's crazy to think that evil that is clearly described in the Bible is just fine. And God's going to just not care at all. No, I don't think so. I don't think so. No, no. Noah's faith was in what was about to come. Now, in Noah's day, let's go to the boat in the middle there. I'm almost done. Imminent catastrophe in the days of Noah, especially by flood when there'd never been one. Just like no one has ever seen the judgment, no one has ever seen the kind of judgment that is about to come upon our world. All right? And I don't mind. You can write a book about it when I'm gone. And say, Brother French believed his whole life the Lord was coming and the judgment was him. And I have no problem whatsoever. I believe that we are so close to the coming of the Lord. We are so close to it. But here we are in a world just like Noah's day where it seemed foolish. To believe that judgment was coming. Jesus warns us of the same point of no return that he 
warned Noah of. Now look at Mar uh, Matthew 24 at the bottom of this, this slide. As the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Exactly like it was. Now I happen to believe that we're living in that day. And I get people all the time call me, you know, so-and-so's got to happen, and, 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 and they got to do this, and so on. And I say, no, 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 no. I don't think so. Now, I, I, if I'm wrong, I'm, I'm wrong, because the Lord's going to come when he wants to come. When he comes, he comes. I believe we're very, 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 very close to the coming of the Lord. And it will be just like it was, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So the, the days of Noah and the coming of Jesus are the same in some way. And he's going to tell us how. For as in, as in, as, <laughs> oh my goodness, as in the days that were before the flood. Everyone say, before the flood. See? That's what we're to be looking for. How will things be before the rapture takes place? This is how I know the church is going in the rapture. Just like how many knows that, that the boat didn't go into the water. It was on the water. It was above the water. And so uh, Noah was saved. Uh, the Bible actually says in First Peter, that he, uh, Second Peter that he was saved by water. But it was water that destroyed the world. But it was the water that lifted. So the, the same thing that brought judgment to the world brought hope to the church and lifts the church out of this world. And so it is that as it was in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, which I take to mean pretty much normal things. They're just going right about their business, ignoring the fact that these are the days before the flood. Ignoring the fact that man is inwardly decayed. It's all around us and pretending it doesn't matter. Someone said, what's the use in preaching holiness in a world like this? Because it gives, it's pleasing to God and it gives us the favor of God. When we live, someone said, one guy told me the other day, well, you're, you're just earning your way into heaven. No, no, no. I'm pleasing the God of heaven. I'm obeying his word. Hallelujah. So it is. They're eating and drinking, giving, marrying, giving image until the day that Noah entered into the ark. In other words, you got right to the day everybody's partying and they knew not. I, I left the K off. Until the flood came, they wouldn't believe it. They were incapable of believing. Let's go to the next slide. We, we're going we're gonna to wrap it up here. I, I want to read two scriptures before we, before we stand. <clears throat> so, did they repent? No, they ridiculed. They always, sin always ridicules righteousness. It's been that way from the very, very beginning. Look at 2 Peter 3, 5, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts. He's basing this on the story of Noah. So I'm suggesting that this scripture is showing us that Noah's generation scoffed and laughed at him. And of course they did, they laughed. And uh, the Bible says in Matthew 24, their ridicule, their being annoyed by it, continued to the very moment of judgment. And so it is. So the startling and sad lack of concern was laid at the feet of the fact that they did not have the ability to comprehend that their own living, the way they were living. So... So the only way to oppose this is to say, well, you, nobody's perfect. It's like, unless you're perfect, then just do anything. If, since nobody's perfect, kill, murder, live ungodly, it doesn't matter. But the fact of the matter is, we need to live godly lives, because how many knows we need to be like him? <clears throat> we need to be like the Lord in our, in our very lives. And so it is. One more verse, and then let's stand. 
All right, First Peter 3.20, there, there were a few, that is eight souls, First Peter 3.20, were saved. It goes on to say by water, all right? But Second Peter 2.5 is our last verse. The Bible says, and God spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person. All of this needs to be uh, unpacked a little bit. But saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of what? Righteousness. And just a few verses before, which I, I knew we wouldn't be able to get to it, what says it was the world was they were disobedient. They disobeyed God and thought they could party. It would make no difference. But, this, but God saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing the flood upon the world of the ungodly. So Noah's favor from God brought divine blessing. He built the ark and salvation was limited to Noah's family alone. There was no uh, salvation outside of God's provision. And I want to tell you something right now. I hope everybody will be saved. Can you say praise the Lord? I hope America will be saved. But nobody's going to be saved outside of God's provision. His salvation. You need to find it. You need to get your Bible. You need to be repent of your sin. You need to get baptized in Jesus' name and receive the Holy Ghost speaking in other tongues and live a godly life. Could we lift our hands and let's pray that God will help us. Father, today, thank you for our are looking at the life of this great man of God, Lord, that saved his family and, Lord, brought salvation really to the whole world because had it not been for him, humankind would have been destroyed. But we thank you because, Lord, you're with us, you're blessing us, and we give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Could you clap your hands and let's thank God for his word for a moment. We're going um, <clears> to, <throat> I'm going to step away because praise team is coming. I need to, they're, they're worried sick. I'm not going to get out of the way. So I want you to find three three or four people, and uh, we've got about five minutes, and greet them. Greet somebody, shake their hands in Jesus' name. Thank you. God bless you. Welcome today.